Welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, where I teach educated, successful couples how to have incredible, passionate relationships so that you can stop compromising and start feeling fully alive in your relationship. I'm Alexandra Stockwell, a.k.a. The Intimacy Doctor. I'm a physician, a relationship and intimacy coach, and I'm an intimate marriage expert. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. We have four children and full professional lives, and we've created an amazing marriage. I've shown hundreds of couples how to do so as well. So if you want to deepen your understanding of your own relationship and learn to access new heights of emotional, sensual, and erotic intimacy, you're in the right place. I will show you how. Now, let's dive in. What's the thing that people dread the most? And in fact, many people actually don't dread it. They experience it when it comes to long-lasting relationships. I think the biggest concern is that it's going to be boring. Of course, there are people who are concerned when the relationship is toxic or just it's otherwise unsafe. But in healthy marriages with good people who are basically kind and definitely love one another and plan to live the rest of their lives together, the biggest concern? Boredom. That things which start out juicy and dynamic become dehydrated and stale, bland, flat. I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing this because chances are you know exactly what I'm talking about, but that really is the biggest concern. And in this episode, I want to share my number one way to avoid boredom, assuming that you don't have any particular problems or challenges or miscommunication or love language mismatch or a kind of awkwardness challenges, just not feeling a lot of pleasure in the bedroom. Like there are plenty of situations in which what I'm about to describe is not the cure, but assuming things are moving along healthy, you enjoy one another, but things are just kind of bland and boring. Of course, you might not be saying that because you don't want to be so negative about your own relationship. But between you and me, I'm just going to say boring or heading towards boring or at risk of being boring. That is the situation that I want to talk about. And before I get into it directly, I want to come in through the back door and Describe what it was like. I was going to say in the early years, but honestly, all of the years of parenting with my husband. Now, I don't think he really had any peers where this was the case, but he always wanted to be a father. He really looked forward to it. I personally was not as clear that I wanted to have children. I mean, I could see that mothering would be amazing, but I also could see so many other possibilities for my life. So I'm not somebody who spent my whole young childhood, older childhood, and early adulthood with complete conviction that, yes, of course, I was going to become a mother. No, I have become a mother, and I I am gratified beyond measure. But the point is, that's not how I always felt. My husband, on the other hand, He always knew he wanted to have children. He always knew that being a father was one of his most important identities, and he looked forward to it. So when our first child was born, I think he was just astonished at how unprepared he actually was. When you have a living, breathing infant fully dependent on you for everything, and not necessarily going to sleep when you would like, it's intense. And then we had a second, 
a third, a fourth. And with each child and with each number of children, there was something that was unexpected initially, but then we came to expect it. <laughs> Although that didn't necessarily make it easier. And that is the following that when a child is, let's say, 18 months and they are becoming expressive of their own will, their own desires, and sometimes those desires are inconvenient. So while, of course, we don't want to squash our children's vibrant, like full spectrum expression, having it can be very inconvenient at different times. And also when when a child is sad or angry, it's hard to know how to navigate that. And so I remember when my husband, he really got in the groove and he was patient and he was effective and he knew just how to meet our daughter where she was in one of the more challenging moments. When as he got comfortable, she emerged into the next stage, which called on a whole new set of tools, attitudes, and internal growth and presence. And this happened over and over and over again. You know, you get used to having children who are in kindergarten, and then it's time for first grade. You get used to children in elementary school. You know how to be a successful, loving parent with connection and believing in your child and having them feel your support. And then suddenly you have a child in middle school and the rules of the game have completely changed. My husband grew up playing tons and tons of games and thinks in that way. And he'd think, okay, I know the rules of this game. I know how to win. I know how to love and serve and parent in this setting. And then He'd take a breath and the rules had changed because while it was much appreciated that he would help put shoes on and tie them, now that was totally off base and the child was going to do it themselves. Or a child would be glad to have you feed them and now they want to do it themselves. I mean, I could, I'm giving examples from, you know, young children, but of course I could give them for um, 16 and 17 year olds. It's like, can you help me with this? Don't help me with this. Like I'm doing it myself. Anyone who has been closely involved with your own or other people's children as they develop over time, this is, this is a frequent phenomenon. When you get comfortable parenting the children where they are, when you're lucky enough to have the skills to do that in the context where that's possible, you can't get comfortable and rest on your achievements for very long because sure enough, you turn around and the child needs something else. Okay, so is this familiar? Do you know what I'm talking about? Even if you haven't necessarily expressed it in this way, there's a way in which the ground is constantly shifting as for parents as children grow. And what I want to say is, this is beautiful. This is normal. It reminds me of that saying, you know, if you're not growing, then you're dying. There's no in between. There's no hanging out, feeling comfortable and settled. That is, albeit a uh, not very devastating form of it, but that is a form of decay. We're either inhaling or we're exhaling. We're expanding or we're contracting. And there really is nothing wrong with contracting. There's obviously nothing wrong with ex exhaling. If you, um, if you have a pulmonary disease where you can't exhale, you know how important that is. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we can see things very clearly when it comes to children. And I think in a much more nuanced and less in your face way, there's something very, very similar that is happening for adults, particularly in marriages or long term committed relationships, where we continue to grow. We 
have more life experience, we have new challenges, we have new reflections. It is normal to continue to grow over the course of our lifetime. And the healthy, passionate, vibrant, nourishing, joy filled relationship is going to also grow with us. It, it's like, um, we need our relationship to expand to our new shape and size and not be ill fitting or something that doesn't work for us anymore. Because when you're ready to grow and expand and your relationship isn't, two things happen. One is you do go ahead and grow and expand and it creates discomfort, conflict, perhaps divorce, the deterioration of the relationship because you've continued to grow and the relationship can't accommodate it. Or you unconsciously sacrifice your own growth in order to maintain the relationship, in order to have things be comfortable, connected, and status quo, ultimately heading towards bland and boring. So I really have two points that I want you to take away as a result of listening to this episode. The one is to understand the nature of the problem, which I've spelled out so far, and then I'm going to talk about the solution. But anyway, the nature of the problem is that it is normal for you to grow, evolve, expand, mess up, learn from your mistakes, try something new, If you have always loved vanilla, maybe you want to have strawberry or chocolate or rainbow sorbet. That is normal, healthy, and in the nature of being human, so long as we are not stressed and unable to relax enough to expand in these luxurious, wonderful, unpredictable ways. In fact, in our society, we've kind of codified this and come to not exactly be okay with, but when it's happening to other people, we intellectually understand the phenomenon of the midlife crisis. We understand the phenomenon of adolescence. But neither of those need to be so destructive if overall we have a healthy, positive embracing attitude towards our growth. So you as a human being are definitely oriented to grow and expand so long as you're not stressed or in a trauma response. But if you are internally peaceful and relaxed enough, growth is your natural state, growth and expansion. And if you're in a relationship that isn't okay with growth, that the terms of the relationship, the container of the relationship is one that doesn't embrace growth, then you're stuck because either you choose your own growth, which you are naturally drawn to, and it really messes with the relationship, or you prioritize the peacefulness in the relationship and you sacrifice your own growth. And neither one of those is a viable option. In fact, I think it's pretty commonly understood that there, even when it's the right situation, that divorce is a devastating breakdown of a relationship. And so it, you know, it's not something we would ever wish for ourselves or someone else. But sacrificing your own growth in order to maintain the relationship while that may be more convenient for stability, for maintaining family life, for financial success, for you, for you as a human being who wants to grow, it is not a good option and it is what results in boredom. 
and disconnection and compromise and a lack of intimacy. Okay, so there's the problem. What is the solution? It is to have your relationship be marinating in a commitment to growth. So maybe you set it up that way. My husband and I actually did. We were clear that the overriding principle, the foundation of our relationship was a really deep devotion to our own and one another's personal growth. And there are all kinds of things that we have done that were uncomfortable that we wouldn't have imagined would be helpful for the marriage. But because we prioritized our own growth and our marriage expanded to accommodate that, it actually worked out incredibly well for our marriage. So maybe you've set up your marriage that way as well. But maybe what I'm talking about in this episode, aiming to both be kind of direct and explicit and also meandering and descriptive of how this actually plays out in any given moment, um, maybe it's a new concept or it's not such a new concept, but you're wondering how can you pivot to have your relationship expand and include growth. And here's what I want to offer to you. One of the best things that my husband and I ever did was choose to always have an area of growth in our relationship. There's always something that we both understand we're working on, enjoying, and learning. We've had phases where it was all about sensuality and touch and having sex or making love every day for a month. We've had phases like that. We've had phases where the the attention, the growth and learning was on having fun, that he has fun and I have fun, and maybe we're having fun together, but that's not inherently part of it, where I'm watching movies by myself that I'm interested in and he's not interested in. And he loves to go Israeli folk dancing, which it's okay, but it's not something that lights me up and nourishes my soul the way it does for him. And it was such a beautiful evolution in our marriage when I said, well, go do that. Like, go have fun doing that. And we've had times where our shared focus was more on working out and being healthy and fit. In fact, I I um I know a couple that they have a very similar approach and they would run up mountains near where they lived in July. Like every day they'd run up mountains together and sure it was great for their individual fitness, but it does it did something just totally incredible in nurturing the bond between them. There have been other times when our focus has been on our family, like really highly prioritizing that we have dinner together as a family. Or um, maybe an area of growth was to switch up power dynamics. When our children were young and I had finished my training as a physician, I was mostly at home and he was mostly at work. And so it was, instead of looking at it as a, it as a stress, we looked at it as growth and expansion in our relationship when we flipped that for a little while. And I really went full on into my relationship and intimacy coaching business. So the point I want to make here is that you can calibrate this to whatever is a bit of a stretch, but not too much of a stretch for both of you. Maybe for a month or a quarter, you want to once a week go to a new restaurant and explore it together. Maybe you want to 
make out with the understanding that it's not going to lead anywhere and it's all about enjoying the make out. Maybe it's that you want to make a point of talking to one another about what's happening during your work days because you, one or both of you tends to compartmentalize that and it creates a kind of a barrier in your emotional intimacy. The point that I'm wanting to make is that being intentional about an area of growth that's alive for both of you is one of the most amazing ways that is sure to be an antidote to boredom. As long as you're choosing to focus on things which genuinely interest you. And if you don't have an interest in common, you can each focus on something different, but make a point of sharing it with one another and talking about it together. You know, I often like to tell you about couples who implement whatever principle I'm teaching. And I've shared certainly about my husband and I in relation to this principle. I also have loads and loads of couples in mind to tell you their story and how having a growth-oriented focus and a theme or a topic for learning has just completely enhanced their connection. But the fact is that anybody who signs up for one of my programs or um, any individual or couple that I do private relationship and intimacy coaching with, by virtue of the fact that you're working through the Aligned and Hot Marriage program, or you are listening to my program called Intimacy, which is about emotional intimacy, sensual intimacy, and sexual erotic intimacy, or if you're coaching with me for six weeks or six months, whichever one of those it is, that then is a focus for your growth. So really 100% of the people who are my clients are examples of this phenomenon. If you do one of my programs, that creates a focus for the growth in your relationship. Or if you find a book that you read out loud together and discuss like, that's also an area of growth. And it could be a book about relationships. It could be a novel. The point is that whatever it is that you choose to focus on together and learn and grow, assuming your relationship is otherwise healthy, there's no toxicity, you're not in the process of recover recovering from infidelity or some kind of financial dis destruction or honestly devastation from the pandemic. Like if things are basically good, the number one antidote to the boredom in long lasting relationships is to have an ongoing focus for your growth. And actually, you know, I'm reminded this is something that is true for individuals as well, because if you look at the people who are like fit and fantastic at 95 and 102, these incredible individuals, every now and then there's an article in the newspaper. If you look them up, you can find them. They always talk about continuing to learn. I remember um, this was a while ago. I don't remember their names, but just this gorgeous woman at 97 who in her 70s started learning French for the first time. Or another one who took piano lessons for the first time at 85. Like it's not that she waited all her life to learn French. It's that in every decade, she was continuing to learn and grow and stimulate her mind and open her heart to new experiences and also grow and learn physically in terms of new dances or walking on new terrain. So 
This has been well studied. I'm not prepared to discuss the research in any detail, but this has been well studied that continuing to learn and grow contributes to individual longevity and health and vitality. And I could summarize the point I want to make today by saying that is also true for couples in a relationship that for your marriage, the key to vitality, longevity, gratification, joy, and a kind of empowered satisfaction, the key to that is ongoing growth, a willingness to learn new things, to have conversations you haven't had before, to take dancing lessons if you never have, to sign up for one of my programs if that's calling to you, to just to do anything that you have wanted to do or you're curious to try, especially if you've put it aside because you think that just won't work in your relationship. My hope is that having listened to this episode, Your mind is flooded with things that you and your partner could do to enhance the connection and individually feel more engaged. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and please leave a rating and a review. And if you're ready to deepen your relationship and create a truly intimate, delicious, and vibrant marriage, head over to the Work With Me page at alexandrastockwell.com and choose the program that's right for you.